Uh, thank you, Paul. So uh, I don't know why any of us would want to talk about climate change on a day like today. <laughs> But it was making me think about uh, a silly story I heard years ago. So uh, the story years ago was uh, Ole and Sven were talking in northern Minnesota. <laughs> and Ole is telling Sven that he's really worried about his wife. He says, you know, my wife, she's been standing with her nose against the glass of a window, looking in, looking out the window for the past three days. And it's 30 degrees below zero. And if she's keeping doing that much longer, he's going to have to let her in. <laughs> so that's really stupid. Um, <laughs> but what's not stupid is the work we're trying to do here uh, about sustainability. So I got exposed to this uh, years ago. But in healthcare, I exposed about four years ago. I was talking with Jeff Thompson. He's the CEO of uh, Gunderson, uh, Gunderson Lutheran Health System over in uh, La Crosse, Wisconsin. And he was telling me the work they're doing. And I, I was, my initial reaction was, so Jeff, you're, you're putting turbines in the Mississippi River for hydroelectric power. You're doing all this other stuff. I understand energy conservation and stuff. But why are you doing all this? And he said, well, the first thing what we intend to do is we want to become energy neutral, carbon footprint neutral within five years. I thought, that's incredible thinking. I said, but why are you doing that? He said, well, Dean, as I started to look and calculate how much mercury and arsenic and other uh, toxins go into the air when we have coal burning plants for electricity, all those things indirectly cause lots of harm to our people. You can go and calculate how many cancers and how many illnesses are caused by all that, how much asthma is worsened and stuff. So he said, so I really see sustainability when we don't do this well we're actually making health worse which is sort of warped because then as a health care system we can actually get more business but that's not the business we should get so um, I was pleased I came back and I was scratching my head and I started talking with Bill Mann and Albert Park about stuff and we started a few years ago with some issues of how we could sort of retro commission some buildings and I thought, well, that's a weird term. What does retro commissioning mean? But it basically means analyzing the building to see how we can make them much more efficient, reduce our energy use, and so forth. And then Albert and Bill started talking further, and I started talking with Paul, and it was like, it's as much bigger than just energy consumption. This is also about water usage and recycling and so much more than I ever dreamed. So I'm thrilled that you guys are all here today to learn more about that. I think it's something that we can do that will benefit all of us individually. It'll benefit us as an organization, and it'll certainly benefit our community because it'll really lead to better health when we can do a better job at this. So uh, have a great morning. So what I want to talk about is what we've been doing in IT over the last oh, about seven years to reduce the energy we use at our data center. As you may or may not know, IT moved into a brand new data center in the 222 building. It's in downtown Appleton. For those of you who have been Appleton natives for a long time, it's the old AAL building, um, right kitty corner from the Paper Valley Hotel. We're on the seventh floor up there. And we have most of our IT staff there, as well as our, our corporate computer room, which uh, we have a picture of here. Uh, the computer room itself is about 3,000 square feet of raised floor space with um, multiple dedicated air conditioning units in it, uh, dedicated battery-backed power and generator systems. These are what you guys use to do your day-to-day -day work, to run Epic, to, to get you paid, to do our Heartbeat website, and everything else that you do with a computer is run through this, uh, through this room in some way, shape, or form. So uh, it's a critical piece of our, our corporate infrastructure, and it also is a very uh, high utilizer of energy uh, and, a, and a high expense for the organization. So we're going to talk about kind of what we did to, uh, to reduce those costs. So again, as I stated, we moved in in the fall of 2006, so our first full year is 2007. We actually have been keeping data on our energy usage since then, so um, this is all based on hard facts. I could bring up the spreadsheet for you, but it would be so big and massive that you would all have to stand right next to the screen to get anything out of it. But so basically in 2007, that was our first full year in our data center. At the time, we had about a little under 400 servers 
And there, there's two, two terms up there, physical and virtual. So that's kind of something that hope you can understand. A physical server is something you can touch. It's like your desktop computer at home. It's a piece of equipment that we put into a rack in our computer room. A virtual server is a newer, uh, something that started out about this time uh, where you take something and virtualize it, which means it's a set of software and instructions that tells a physical server what to do. What that allows us to do, oh, well, I'll, I'll explain that a little better as, as we move forward through the presentation. But back in 2007, for the, for the entire year, the average monthly cost per kilowatt hour was just under seven cents, 6.8 cents. We used over two million kilowatt hours in 2007. So remember that number. And our annual energy expense just for that computer room that you saw was $140,000, okay? Um, so recognizing that, uh, there are things we needed to do to help lower our costs and also use our time more efficiently. This makes it easier for us. I'm a systems engineer in IT and we have about a dozen of us over there now. Uh, and it's our job to maintain these things. And it, the initiatives we talked about here not only reduce our energy usage and our cost, it also helps us do a, an easier, better job of maintaining that corporate data center, that infrastructure that you saw. So, but one of the, one of the things you should know is that cooling in the computer room accounts for about 40, for 40 to 50 percent of the total energy costs of that computer room. Servers uh, and all computers, the faster and the better they get and the smaller they get, the hotter they run, the more cooling they need. So um, keeping that in mind, so it's not all the cost of, of the servers themselves or the network, a lot of it is in the cooling. And because really there's four air conditioners in there, it's very, a very focused area where we can spend a lot of energy, a lot of time, I meant, I should say, to try and reduce the use by, those, by that equipment. So some of the things we've talked about, and we'll go over these in a little more detail in the, in the next few slides here, but talk about something called free cooling and then server virtualization, cold aisle containment, using variable speed fan motors on those air conditioning units, and using sensor-based cooling so we deliver the, the correct amount of cooling to where it needs to go. So free cooling, uh, a technical definition is that's an economical method of using low external air temperatures to assist in chilling water or glycol in our case, some sort of cooling medium in your air conditioning system which can then be used for air conditioning systems. What this means is that this time of year we can take advantage of this. An air conditioning system, we have a, a unit in the computer room, a big unit, it's got fan blowers in it and it's got heat exchanger in it that takes the chilled water or chilled glycol in this case and turns it into cold air that gets blown on the air conditioning systems or blown, blown on the server systems. And then that gets pumped up to a unit on the roof with a bunch of fans on it that has compressors in it that take the heat that is generated from that process in the computer room and ex expels that heat and turns that back cold and sends it back down to the air conditioners. What we can do this time of year is take those compressors in those chiller units on the roof and turn them off. There's enough cold air around those chiller units to cool that glycol without having to run compressors. It's very economical. Um, it saves our energy by, again, not allowing those compressors to run. And we've, the, the computer room air conditioning units we bought when we implemented this in 2006 had this feature on it, but it wasn't fully enabled. We enabled it in about 2009, 2010. So if you want to go to the next slide. Uh, this is actually a, a shot of our control panel on one of our air conditioning units here. And some of the things you'll notice that there's in the red highlighted box, there's a little snowflakey thing. That would be conventional air conditioning. That's using the compressor-based chilling. And as you can see, this was taken last week. Right now, we're not using any compressed-based chilling on our air conditioning system. And the FC stands for free cooling. And we actually have capacity that we're not using. We're only using 78% of that capacity to meet our cooling requirements in the computer room today. So that, that's an example of how that in the summer, free cooling goes to zero because the air outside is too warm to, to, to generate any cooling from. And the, the little snowflake there will go up from some percentage to from 50 to 100 percent. So that's why it costs more in the summer to keep our stuff cool than it does in the winter. Server virtualization is another uh, concept that we use to reduce cost. It basically reduces the number of physical servers we had. 
in the past, in the mid-2000s, like when we first moved in here, if you wanted to do something, you bought a server to do it. It stored the data for that, it ran the programs, it uh, prepared the interface that you deal with on your computer, on your personal computer or your wind term or whatever you're using, and it was typically one for one. You had an application and you had a server that went with it. Well, 90% of the time that server really wasn't doing anything. It was sitting there doing nothing, waiting for you as users of that application to use it. What server virtualization does is it allows us to take that physical server, the applications that run on that, and turn it into a virtual thing that we can then load on top of physical servers. But what we can do then is load multiple virtual servers on one physical server. What that means is that that server is being utilized at a higher percentage and takes advantage of what we bought that for, which is to do computing processes um, versus sitting around doing nothing if it were a physical application on there. Uh, we've started this in 2008 and we've been expanding this significantly over the last several years to the point right now where we're about over two-thirds virtualized. That means two-thirds of the stuff we do in our computer room is done on virtual servers. And if you look at the very bottom, we're actually running about eight to ten virtual servers per physical server. What that means is we have, for those seven, six, seven hundred servers that are now virtual, we have a lot less servers that are physical to run those, maybe a hundred, or less than a hundred physical servers to run, uh, to run that. What that means from, from a power consumption standpoint is reduced electrical power to run those servers. We don't have as many servers, there aren't as many things plugged into the wall. And more importantly, a significantly amount, a reduced amount of air conditioning needed to keep those servers running cool and proper. Just an example of a couple different types of server virtualization here. This picture on the left shows, that's, that's called a blade chassis. There's 14 servers in there. 14 servers used to take up a space about this much in, in one of these racks, which is on the right. And now we use those things. They're very small and they slide into a unit. So there's shared components in there that also reduce our cost. There's shared cooling fans, there's shared power supplies. That helps us reduce cost. And in that ch chassis there, we can probably run 100 or more virtual servers in a space about this big. Sorry. Yeah, if you want to go back to that one. And then on the right there, basically that shows a rack <laughs> that used to be full of those servers, and now it's got one left in it. And the rest of that stuff, they're just plastic panels which help blank off the, so the airflow doesn't flow through there which we'll talk about in the cold aisle containment section. Cold aisle containment, by definition, is a physical separation of the hot and cold aisles using blanking panels like you saw in that last picture and the servers themselves and curtains to create sealed up environments where the cold air can't just automatically flow and be returned to the air conditioning systems without being used by the sources that need cooling. It'd be an example I would use would be if you went on a picnic and you brought some beverages with you. And in order to keep those beverages cool, you bought a bag of ice. And you threw the bag of ice on the ground, busted it open, and set your soda on top of the ice. Well, sir, your soda would probably get cooled down, but your ice would be wasted on all just the environment that it would just, the cool air would just glow, you know, blow off of there into, the, into space and not be focused on keeping that soda cold. You'd go through a lot more ice, it'd be a lot more costly and your probably soda wouldn't stay as cold as it needs to be. Hence, the first cold aisle containment system is a cooler, right? You take a cooler, you put your soda in, you put ice on top, the ice stays cold, the soda stays cold, you don't need to keep replenishing the supply of ice all day or whatever, and it works very well. That's what a cold aisle containment system is. Um, we implemented this in March 2010. We were one of the first people in the state of Wisconsin to do this not just healthcare, but in the state of Wisconsin. We had a gentleman, one of the directors of the Focus on Energy program from the state came up and took pictures of our data center when we put this in. Um, and basically, so he was very impressed with that. Unfortunately, at that time, <laughs> Focus on Energy didn't have any rebate programs available for this because it was so new. So we kind of got, uh, we, could, we would have probably gotten some reimbursement on it. It really wasn't that expensive compared to the energy savings we're realizing. This had, a, this had a payback of probably a year or less than a year, like Gary talked about, quick paybacks on, on some of these things. Basically, the way it works, it's kind of hard to see these pictures, but so these are rows of servers, and we put the cold parts of the servers to the inside so they face each other, and they suck the cold air in the front of the servers, and on the back side of the servers, 
they blow the hot air out. And then in the floor here, there's vents. The cold air blows up from the floor, gets sucked in the front of the servers, blows out the back, and gets an exhaust up into the ceiling, which goes back to the air conditioning system. Without these cold out containment systems, this cold air, a lot of this cold air would blow straight up. The vents, oops, sorry. Oh, OK. Stay a little yeah, I get a little emphatic about this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Got to get excited about something, right? Um, in, in the past, what would happen is the cold air would blow up out of these vents, blow straight up over the racks and not be sucked in, and be sucked in by the, by the, the hot air return vents. And that's, it's called short cycling. It's very inefficient. It requires these air conditioners to run a lot harder to provide enough cold air to keep everything cool. So what you can see is we, we put these plastic curtains up and if you've been into a you know, supermarket or something like that where they have a walk-in cooler, that's exact, it's made by the same company, a company called Sub-Zero, makes these curtains. And this is what the inside looks. So you have the server racks, and above that, all the way to the ceiling, there's a plastic containment that wraps all the way around this. It's, it's very economical, and it works, it works great. The last thing we put in just this last year, and actually we're still in the process of implementing this, is something called variable frequency drive motors in our fans. This is another way to reduce the energy used by our air conditioning systems. In the past, our, the fans, and these are big motors. These are huge motors. These air conditioning systems are about from me to Craig, and not quite that, from me to that black cabinet there in size, and we have four of them in there, um, of which there's always two running at one time. They were either all on 100% or all off. So if we needed cooling, they were on 100%. And we always needed cooling, so they were always blowing at 100% whether we needed it or not. What the variable frequency drive motors is something that just came out. We can put those in there, and, and using the sensor-based cooling, it can figure out how much cold air it needs to deliver and scale back the speed of the fan motor, which, again, reduces energy cost by not having to run it at 100%. The sensor-based cooling, then, will, will tell the air conditioners we have two air conditioners running at any one time, and they're physically in separate locations. It knows that if this particular row needs more cooling, that's provided primarily by this air conditioner. It'll ramp that one up and not the other one. So again, that's, that's how this whole thing will work. We're in the process of getting that finalized. It's, been a, it's kind of a longer implementation than we had anticipated. But uh, we're, we're pretty close to getting that done and, and start realizing the savings based on that. If you want to go to the next one. So this is, again, our, our picture of our of our uh, air conditioning control panel. And as you can see, the, the little fan motor, the little fan icon there represents the fan motor speed. And right now, we're running at only 89%. Not a whole lot different than 100%. We've actually seen this go down at times about in the low 70s. So depending on what the cooling requirements are, um, it can ramp that, that, that fan back and, and save us energy. So fast forward to last year. Now, if you remember where we were at the beginning, we had about 380 total servers. Today we have 950, of which 610 are virtual and 340 are physical. Now don't assume when I said the ratio was 8 or 10 to 1 virtual to physical. A lot of these physical servers are still applications that require a physical server. Not everything can be virtualized. So that's why that ratio doesn't work. But still, that's uh, two and a half to three times as many servers as we had back in 2007. However, our, our average cost of per kilowatt hour for our energy that we're paying was up to almost nine and a half cents, or just over nine and a half cents. That's a 40% increase in six years, over 2007. Um, and actually, in our, in our last couple of bills, that's up almost to 10 cents now, a, a kilowatt hour. Our, however, our an annual energy use in that data center was under 1.5 million kilowatts. Remember, we were at over 2 million before. So that's a 28% reduction. And basically, what because of these things, we've been able to keep our energy expenses flat from 2007 to today. Um, so we've really, over the years, while our energy cost from a, from a per unit base has gone like this, our utilization has gone like this, and our actual expense has stayed pretty flat. Um, and this is just a kind of a graph to show you year by year what has happened and the impact that we've had. So re initially, you can see our energy cost has gone up a little bit, a little bit, then a little bit more, then a lot, then a little bit, then a lot. So it's, it's very fluctuating, much like your energy bills at home. Our utilization is 
really in 2010, 2009, 2010 is when we really started kicking in these efforts to try and reduce our energy costs. So you can see here that we've ramped up, you know, around that 2 million kilowatt hours mark, but then we started reducing actually in 2011 by significant amounts until last year, uh, where you can see the biggest reduction of all. And again, our annual cost for that energy is on the right there, where we kind of kind of a bell curve where it went up and then back down. And I ran a couple numbers here, which I didn't put up here, but if you add those total costs up, that's a little over a million dollars just for the energy for our computer room for one, two, three, uh, I guess that's seven years. So let's just say we didn't do anything and we stayed where we were at 2010. So let's say this is the amount of energy, or 2009. We, we, we took that rate, which was the highest on this chart, and just filled it in down here. Our energy for that computer room would have cost us over $180,000 more than, than what we did spend by using our reduction efforts. And let's just assume some normal business growth. And we used physical servers and didn't implement any of the air conditioning uh, reduction efforts that we, we, we put in here. And we just assume that this energy from this point on went up 10% a year. Not an unrealistic amount considering the growth that Theta Care has gone through over this time. Um, and the amount of things that IT is doing that you're doing with IT, I should say, over that time period. So if, if we would have just grown that energy use by 10% based on these costs, we would have spent almost $600,000 more on energy for that computer room than what we're spending today. And so we're constantly looking at ways, we're working with our, with our partner vendors on this, Access Inc., Liebert, uh, Bassett Air Conditioning, who, who work with us closely on this stuff to try and figure out how, ways that we can you know, reduce these dollars and this usage, which is great for the organizations because that means that's money that we can use for other, you know, more important, uh, energy is important, but use for more things that we can get more bang for our buck out of than, than, buy, than keeping the lights on, I guess, in our computer room. So, do you have any questions about any of that? Or? I never talk in front of a lot of people, so I might be a little nervous, so I might ramble on a little bit, so. Um, I'm uh, by trade a surgical tech. I started 11 years in the uh, ago in, for Theta Care in the operating room. And then from there I went into purchasing and uh, pretty much everything uh, that I do in purchasing is about cost savings. And most of the things that you use in your facilities probably I had my hand on there somewhere. And some of it you like and some of you probably don't like. And so uh, as I was uh, thinking about all the uh, disposable products that we use in the uh, operating room, it came to me as I was reading that most of the waste, well, notoriously, hospitals and schools are one of the worst places that recycle, typically. And in the operating room, when you think about all the products that we use in the operating room uh, in the system, almost all of it gravitates to the rest of the units. So most of the waste that the hospital generates is from the operating room, some 40% of the waste comes out of the operating room. And so how I got into the green thing, I really don't know. I just landed in my lap one day and some, for some reason I'm compelled to do it. So I just do it. And, um, but my, one of my main objectives was, as I do the cost savings, was to, uh, I try to achieve three things. I try to make sure that what we purchase is green try to make it streamlined for the team that uses the ops, the, uh, the products, and I try to make it better for the patients. I don't hit all three, but I try to typically at least try to hit one of those things. So in 2011, one of the first things that we um, uh, started to do was uh, reprocess medical devices. So I put a, a device in here. This is a stapler that's used in the operating room. And uh, since 2011, a lot of these devices we reprocess and reuse again. I could tell you since 2011, the impact of waste savings and cost savings was a total of $1,874,000 just by doing this one initiative. And that includes the waste savings and uh, not having to purchase new ones all the time. After that in fact, I decided that uh, we get to this box. I don't know, you've probably seen these boxes, people taking them home all the time. Uh, they make good storage boxes, but it actually has a good story to it. 
is I only, I, when I purchase things for the OR, I try to see when I purchase what effect I have because if I'm initially initiating the buying, then I'm compelling someone else to create waste. So in the OR, we typically pick cases every day. We have employees pick the cases. And so I came up with this little idea where this uh, box, the case is pre-picked in another facility and brought into the OR. So it makes the team in the OR pick cases a lot quicker instead of maybe picking a case in 30 minutes, they could pick a case in 10 minutes. Plus, instead of the, the 100 items that are in this box with 100 different SKUs for charging, this box creates one SKU for one charge in, in the, for, for finance. Um, so uh, I can tell you right now that 95% of all the cases that we use in the OR come pre-picked from a separate company. So you say, well, how green is that? Well, if I were to buy all individual products from this company, they would all, all this cardboard would come into the facility, which then I would have to throw out. When I pre-buy these things, uh, those are typically bought in bulk. No cardboard is involved. So I'm not saving it here at ThetaCare, but I'm saving it someplace else. So that was the second thing I came up. And then the, the, the next thing I came up was all the plastic bottles and things that we purchase in the OR, all the different articles that we purchase in our OR. And I was thinking to myself, well, how come we're not recycling any of those things in the OR as it is now? So I was talking around, and they were saying, well, where will we store the things? Where will we put the things? We have no place to get rid of the items, so we have no room for the things. So I got to thinking about that a little bit, and so I came up with this little idea, is I teamed up with Gunderson Cleaners, who typically sends a truck to the facility already, and I knew they had a compactor on their dock. And so I uh, got together with Gunderson and I asked them, well, what if I were to send my things to you? Could we recycle and compact, use your compactor? So we got together with them, and we came up with this little unit. And in here, I knew if I had to have everybody think of what number was on a plastic and stuff like that, they probably wouldn't do any of it. So um, I said, just put all your things in this little bin right here, and I'll separate it on the back end. I just wanted them to put it in here. And they said, well, where do we start? I said, just throw it down the laundry chute, because Gunderson's going to pick it up. So we have one of these in each OR. And... Uh, uh, my plan would be to gravitate it into the rest of the system eventually, but all the employees, they just throw the plastic bottles, everything in this little bag here, tie it up, it goes with the laundry, Gunderson picks it up with their truck, takes it to the compactor, I separate it on the back end, and then recycle it all. So that's what we're bringing today. So I wanted to do, uh, um, I have enough knowledge in my, that I, I'm dangerous, so... Um, <laughs> So I brought some things, so I think visual things is a good thing to um, see when you look at the sheer numbers of the things we purchase in the OR alone, it, it, it's amazing. So I'll just go through some of the things here. Typically, um, oops, we recycle, these are, these are plastic uh, bins that we use in the OR. Uh, for almost all the cases. And so to help me out, I wrote down on my little thing what we have here. Typically, we uh, recycle these now, 4.5 tons of these we buy in the OR, or uh, 76,233 pieces of plastic We just in the OR alone. I know on the floors you see uh, uh, other basins, which we can go after a little bit later, but this is just plastics in the OR. They used to be blue but I changed them to opaque because when you go to recycle, opaque chips or beads when they recycle this, is, uh, you get more money for it than if it was colored because they can use opaque for more items as it makes it back into the system. So that was that item. Uh, uh, we use paper cups in the OR. So I changed the paper cups to sugar cane cups sugarcane cup is already a result of making sugarcane. So I'm actually saving trees there. So that's 70,200 cups we use. I changed those. Along. Excuse me, are those biodegradable? Yes, yes. 
bowls. We have bowls because we eat in the OR and we have to eat because sometimes we don't get breaks. Um, 51,000 of those I changed that we use each year in the OR for bowls. So you might see some of those in the floors too. Everybody sees these. Sailing bottles. 72,785 of these bottles we recycle. You could put the caps on, labels, the whole thing. Just right into the container here, and we recycle those items there. These are the items we use to wrap the instruments um, in the OR to make the items sterile before for all the instruments that are used on the patients. 30 tons of those things we buy a year. This is a class 5 plastic. Sooner or later that's not even going to be allowed into the landfill. Um, I got another initiative that I'm working on with this which I'll explain a little bit later but we recycle 30 tons of this a year. My last initiative that you're probably all aware of, the sharps containers. I, uh, last, I think it was two, uh, about three weeks ago, four weeks ago, I changed all the sharps containers out in the system. I changed 1,400 locations. I recycled 1,400 volts, and I packaged 1,400 of these things, and we did it in 60 hours in the system. We eliminated 20,000 of these things we buy a year, eliminated those, Two point, or 21 tons of sharps we sent to the landfill. So typically what this, was done, what this happened is they take these little vaults, they take it, they, they autoclave it, they grind it up and it lands in the landfill. So 21 tons of that a year we, we, we do. And I went to these little items right here. That has a lifespan of 20 years. So these hold more than those, and it's truly the sharps that we're actually recycling in there. Now, I go one step further, is the recycler actually takes the needles out of here and the syringe, and I recycle those. So it's not going into the landfill. So um, I think next week we're going to, uh, in April, we'll do all the outlying clinics, another 1,400 locations on those. So that prevents us from buying these, the bags, because eventually we're going to go to recycle tissue containers, chemo containers, and drug containers, all which we have to use a plastic bag. And as like Paul said to me one time, you're buying it, you recycle it, but then you ask yourself, why am I buying it in the first place? So these bags, I think it was like 20,000 bags a year we buy of these, red bags, that we no longer will buy because of those containers there. Uh, I recycle shrink wrap, shrink wrap that comes into the facility. Uh, I recycle enough sh uh, shrink wrap, enough shrink wrap to cover two acres, one foot thick. So, recycle that much. Oh, the bottles, we recycle enough bottles that would, if I laid those end to end, they would go from Green Bay to Racine. So that's how much that is. Um, Blue bags, y'all see the blue linen bags. I think there's 20,000 rolls uh, or 15,000 bags. We recycle those now. OR, OR towels. We use about 17.18 uh, tons of OR towels. They're one time use. I changed them from blue to undyed, unbleached towels. I sell them to other facilities to keep them in the pool and they're 100% cotton so when they do end up in the landfill they almost disintegrate within a month or so. Um, the cost I get back, I, last year I sold $28,000 worth of towels, brought it back into the system so it actually renders the towels uh, neutral to the operating room. What's on the horizon? Circuits, anesthesia circuits. We use about, I think it's about 12,000 of these things 
a year. So um, this is a recyclable plastic, but people were saying, well, patients breathe it in, so how could you recycle it? It's dirty. So I put a little filter on the end of it that cleans the air as the air goes back into the uh, machine. So all I need to do is cut the filter off and I can recycle about 90% of the tubing on this. So I put that little filter on there. You can come up and look at it later. But it actually is better for the patient because there's been some studies that some uh, gases remain in the anesthesia machine from patient to patient. So this little filter prevents that. Sterile gloves. We use 342,000 of those gloves in the OR. I recycle the outside package in the OR. Uh, trocars. We buy about, uh, in laparoscopic procedures, we use plastic trocars. We use uh, three, four on a patient for each case. And so I was looking at these things, and so I was thinking to myself, um, what can we use instead? So I came up with this little one. I haven't, in, I haven't uh, implemented yet, but it's a reusable trocar. And you, if you look at the size, when you use plastic, it has to be double walled so it doesn't break into the patient. So that means the incision site's a little bit thicker. When you go metal, you can see the size of the trocar is reduced. So that's better for the patient. Just by changing out the five millimeter trocars, it's $82,000 a year savings. And my last addition, we'll go back to the, um, the blue wrap. So we just started an initiative to put all our containers in uh, solid containers to eliminate the blue lap completely. Um, when you talk about what's better for the patient, uh, typically um, when the nurse opens up the pan in the operating room, they hold the thing to the light and look for holes, for breaches in the, in the system. And there's been studies that show that about 35% of the times that they don't see a hole, there's actually a hole in the in the uh, in the uh, Kim guard, they call this. So you can't really say an infection comes from that, but you try to eliminate all the possibilities. So by eliminating these and putting all our instruments in solid containers that have a lifespan of 25 years, we would get a cost savings in 10 years of $1.8 million from not using these things here. So that's an initiative that's actually going on right now. We actually started to change those out. So we're eliminating the 30 tons completely in the landfill. So that's my story. Good morning, everybody. Um, my focus today is really going to talk about hazardous meds, um, but I wanted to also just provide a little bit of a perspective um, and a personal story before I start talking about all that stuff. Um, so this morning I was helping my nine-year-old quickly get ready for school and reminded him to shut the light off in his room. And I thought, wow, that's a great example, Sam. We have to remember to shut our light off. The sun's out. There's really no need to have your light on. And then I remembered the story about when Sam was a baby. And when he was a baby, we actually lived in Michigan, um, almost directly across from Milwaukee and Grand Rapids. And you probably wouldn't think of it, but um, based on the geographical location of Grand Rapids, there was a lot of air pollution over there. I think it was a result of being directly east of Chicago and Gary, Indiana, and a lot of industry. And Sam had asthma as a kid. Um, I mean, he's still a kid. But when he was little, he did have asthma. And we had to treat him every single day. He had inhalers, nebulizers, you name it. Um, and so it just reminded me this morning of dealing with that when we lived over there. And I think it was a result of the climate that led to him having asthma. Um, we moved here when he was about four and a half. And by the time he started school, we didn't have to give him medication anymore. Um, so I was really um, thinking about that this morning, just as I was reminding him to shut the light off, and then thinking about how climate directly affected him, or at least I think it did, in terms of why um, we had to deal with his asthma over there. So that's kind of my personal story also of why I'm here today. Um, I'm also here today to talk about hazardous medications. Um, it may or may not necessarily have a direct correlation with how it's affecting climate, but it certainly has an effect on how we need to protect ourselves from exposure to hazardous medications because of the risks that it may have to ourselves or our patients or the environment. 
Um, so back in 2009, I helped with an initiative within ThetaCare, it, um, specifically within the hospital division, to help ensure that we have better practices for safely handling hazardous medications. Um, and this really is coming from um, a governmental regulation um, that really spearheaded this, knowing that there are hazardous drugs in our workplace, um, and those definitely can have risks to us, not necessarily just the result of it affecting the patients and treating the patients, but when we're handling it, it certainly can have an effect on us, whether it's affecting reproduction, um, our skin, um, other types of um, issues like cancer, maybe even asthma, those sorts of things definitely can be an impact to us. Um, so this is a summary. I have two slides to summarize. I will not go into detail, but this is just showing all the different people and places and organizations and standards and regulatory agencies that have really highlighted the risk of medications that we may be exposed to and then the risk to our health. Um, it's coming from WHO, it comes from EPA, it comes from NIOSH, which is a branch of the um, OSHA component within our government. It even comes from the Department of Transportation when we think about how hazardous meds can be transported um, within our system. Um, and within that, they have multiple studies and different types of meds or medications that they identify as hazardous. So we tried to compile that to figure out, now what are we going to do about this? Um, so looking at these different organizations, um, we really tried to solidify and figure out what we were going to do within ThetaCare, pulling a team together and did an RAE back in 2009 to understand what our practice was going to be to help prevent exposure. Um, we utilized primarily two resources. One was a list from the government, um, from a government organization called NIOSH, um, which stands for the National Institute for Occupational Self Safety and Health. Um, and they publish a list of hazardous drugs almost every year, and we utilize that list to really help us understand what our um, methods will be. And then we also found a great resource from our neighbor in Minnesota, I'm sorry, from California. I wish that was our neighbor. Um, and we, they really identified how to handle the waste um, of pharmaceuticals. Should they go down the drain? Should they go in garbage? Should we recycle? Should we put them into coffee grounds? What should we do with our medication waste that we have? So using those, um, and then really highlighting a lot from the NIOSH um, list, which really has become kind of our backbone, we created our process. So you can go on to the next slide. So um, really just highlighting the risk of um, hazardous meds, which helps spearhead our work, realizing that we have this risk today in our workplace, knowing that about 5.5 million people within our healthcare are exposed to hazardous meds. Um, from a pharmacy perspective, we prep chemo, we prep a lot of hazardous meds, so our techs all day long could be exposed to this. Thinking about the nurse administering this day in and day out, they might be working on an oncology floor, they might be exposed to this day in, day out. We may have just simply forgotten that risk or not realized that risk, um, and we really needed to recognize that there's a lot of data out there to show the risk to ourselves and to our health. Um, and so this was a really interesting depiction about all the different trigger points of where hazardous meds are in our system. So it's not just at the moment I'm preparing it in the chemo room in the pharmacy, or it may not just be um, when I'm administering it to the patient, but staff might also be exposed just on the loading dock when they're unloading these things. We might also be exposing our environmental health service staff who clean those rooms and the risk of getting exposed to maybe linens that have been contaminated or cleaning the toilets or the sinks, um, thinking about the risk of now the people that are dealing with this to dispose of it from our institution and our um, staff or um, colleagues that might be taking that product out of our building to go and dispose of it and what the risk is to them. So it's a very global perspective. Um, there's also a lot of initiative from the environmental perspective about not um, getting this into water streams, not getting this into um, the soil and contaminating food that we grow or the animals that we get our food from. Um, and so there's definitely um, a lot of consideration from an environmental perspective and law that also dictates where we or how we should dispose of hazardous medications safely so it doesn't get into the water stream. So I just wanted to share a quick um, summary of that work that we did back in 2009 and have since um, tried to sustain that and spread that. 
Um, so just a couple items that we utilize today in the hospital system are depicted here. So from a preparation and administration perspective in the pharmacy or um, on the floor um, for administering the med to the patient, we use a couple devices um, that are depicted on the left side of the screen um, that's called Facile. Um, these are devices that we use either while we're preparing the med or when it's being administered to help prevent it from being aerosolized or any droplets from falling onto your skin or splashing onto your skin. Um, also vapors that might um, come off of the product while we're preparing it or reconstituting it. Um, and it seals it within those systems so that it reduces that risk of it being exposed to me as I'm preparing it or maybe me as I'm checking it or giving it. Um, unfortunately, this leads to Jerry's problem where we throw this away. <laughs> so I don't, we, I'm not aware of how to recycle this. I'm not sure we can, but I think we need to talk to figure out some options here. The other consideration is the um, gentleman in the middle who's wearing all of his protective gear. So we also um, really encourage and require our staff to wear this in our pharmacy when they're handling hazardous meds and we encourage staff to wear this or components of it when they're administering those medications. But again, we put this in the trash, in a hazardous waste bin, um, generally. And uh, so it's maybe not environmentally friendly, but we're at least reducing that exposure to our colleagues and our, our friends and coworkers. And then the last item on the very right is our um, specific waste bin that we use for disposing of the hazardous medications, which then are handled by one of our disposal companies in the area to ensure it's appropriately disposed of um, and not necessarily just put directly into the trash, into the landfill or down the drain, which um, we want to prevent. And that's really um, why we're here today. I think that's my last slide. Um, we definitely have um, started the work, but certainly haven't finished it. Um, and know that there's definitely improvements. We also have really just uh, focused this work in the hospital and not necessarily spread this throughout data care. So there's opportunity there as well. My staff and I uh, got together and um, put a little vegetable garden in the back of our office. and. Um, this came about as a result of um, having a brand new building built just for us. Um, it was It's a lead building, so it's environmentally friendly. Um, in addition, um, I was at a wonderful conference that was talking about trying to get healthcare providers to eat healthy so they can teach their patients to eat healthy. And I was thinking about how um, our staff doesn't always eat healthy, so I thought maybe if we had a garden, we could pick it right out of the garden and go eat it for lunch. Um, and also as a team building exercise, this brought us all together. And uh, as a result, we have two plots that are about, I think they're six by eight feet. They're raised beds. Um, Dr. Kranick and his little boy built the beds. My husband and I hauled the dirt in. Um, I also enlisted my husband in rototilling it. Um, <laughs> And he'll be doing that again this year. Um, we've, uh, we've had a lot of fun planning what we're going to put in the garden. Um, we, um, we give the staff gift certificates to the local nursery to buy the vegetables that they want. Um, everybody helps water. Everybody helps weed it. Um, it's something we always talk about. Hey, did you see that new tomato coming in? Um, we've uh, improved our health because we've had salad bars. We've also had um, salsa days as a result of the products that we've grown. Um, we've really come together as a team and we think that um, our office is a little slice of heaven in Darboy, <laughs> if you've been to Darboy. Um, as for um, helping the climate, well, um, this little patch has prevented a little patch of grass being mown so we don't have to worry about emissions from the lawnmower for a few places. Um, it's also a visual reminder that um, everyone should be eating healthy. Um, our struggles have been um, finding time to weed um, periodically. Um, I think it was the last summer, the summer before, it was just so hot and dry. Some of our plants died, and we just we just couldn't help it. Um, we've also struggled with trying to find uh, less uh, or more um, lower maintenance plants. We're going to try some strawberries this year, just because that's fun to look at. Um, our other struggles have been wildlife. Um, two summers ago, uh, Mama Rabbit thought it was really cool to make her nest in our cucumbers, so we had a lot of baby bunnies running around. Um, and we also had some birds make a nest right by the uh, 
the uh, spigot outlet for the watering, which freaked us out all the time for watering it. Um, so I, it's just been a great mood lifter for our office. Um, we've had um, a couple of really good meals together um, because of the products we've had. Um, we've kept it local because we don't have to buy the stuff in the store. Um, and it's, it's just a great use of space. We have all this lawn space at all our offices. It would be kind of neat if all offices could do that. Um, and thinking for the future, um, I don't know if we'll put another bed in. I was also thinking of maybe some Honeycrisp apple trees in the back because we all like that too. Um, that would be something low maintenance. Um, and if we do ever go bigger and have time, we thought maybe it'd be fun to give the food to the hospital so the hospital can serve the patients or give more food if we have it to the food pantries to help share the love. Um, but that's about it.